All right, so we're going to talk about basic pathology today, and this is going to deal with cell and tissue injury. Um, so let's start with amyloidosis. Amyloidosis is fibular protein deposition in interstitial tissue. It's that, that simple. That's the definition of amyloidosis. Fibular protein deposition in interstitial tissue. Now, it's usually linear, non-branching filaments of beta pleated sheets. beta pleated sheets. It may be localized, such as in the brain in Alzheimer's, or it may be systemic, such as in rheumatoid arthritis. We, you don't know. But the diagnosis is made by its beta pleated sheets, uh, demonstrated by apple green apple green biofringence. Apple green biofringence of Congo red stain. of Congo red stain under polarized light and it has a waxy appearance which you can see in the picture here. Now characteristically extracellular, characteristically extracellular in distribution most often appearing as accumulations proximate to the basement membrane. Now what is primary amyloidosis? This is caused by the deposition of amyloid fibrils derived from the immunoglobulin light change, referred to as AL, um, right there, referred to as AL, which is amyloid, amyloid light chain protein. Now, this is deposited in tissues of mesodermal origin. So it is, if it comes from the mesoderm, like the heart, the muscle, the tongue, etc., then that's going to be primary amyloidosis. It's associated with plasma cell disorders such as multiple myeloma um, and Waldenstrom's macro, uh, a macroglobulinia. Now, so that brings us to secondary amyloidosis. This is associated with chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation. Um, and you'll see the AA amyloid. It's caused by deposition of the amyloid protein, the AA protein, formed from a precursor, which is the serum amyloid associated protein, SAAA, or SAA. That's the precursor for AA protein. Now, the SAA is a normal inflammatory protein produced by the body. However, in chronic inflammatory states, overproduction causes it to be deposited in tissues. So chronic tissue destruction leads to increased serum amyloid-associated proteins and involves parenchymous organs such as kidney nephrotic syndrome is very common, the adrenal glands, the pancreas, uh, lymph nodes, the spleen. Um, characteristically, a complication of chronic inflammation or infectious disease such as rheumatoid arthritis, tuberculosis, osteomyelitis, syphilis, um, familial Mediterranean fever, or leprosy. Now, it's also association between secondary amyloidosis and a neoplasm. Secondary, secondary amyloidosis is associated with neoplasia, um, such as Hodgkin's lymphoma and a hypernephroma. And that's about in 4 to 3%, 3 to 4% of patients. So what about, what about Alzheimer's disease and uh, amyloidosis? Well, Alzheimer's disease, you get a beta amyloid deposition in the central nervous system. Now, it's characterized by deposition of beta amyloid derived from the APP, which is amylo amyloid precursor protein. Amyloid precursor protein. The gene that codes for beta amyloid is on chromosome 21. So on chromosome 21, and this helps explain why patients with Down syndromes, like trisomy 21, have an increased frequency of early on onset Alzheimer's. is because it's on the gene 21. Um, the gene that codes for the beta amyloid is on chromosome 21. Remember that. So diabetes mellitus type 2, what's this got to do with amyloidosis? I'm sure you're asking yourself. Well, you have amylin dep deposition in the pancreatic islet cells amylin deposition in the pancreatic islet cells.
This is characterized by deposition of amylin, which is AKA um, islet amyloid polypeptide or IAPP in islet cells. And amylin interferes with insulin sensing, thereby contributing to insulin resistance. So that's how that ties in there. So medullary carcinoma of the thyroid. This is characterized by deposition of the ACAL protein derived from calcitonin. And long-term hemodialysis. This is associated with deposition of the beta-2 microglobulin. Normally a component of what? Normally a component of the MHC class 1. And then you got senile amyloidosis. This is characterized by minor dep depositions of amyloid found at autopsy in the very elderly people. Um, it may involve the heart and the brain. The fibrils of senile cardiac amyloidosis consist of the transport protein thyretinin, and that's the TTR. Transport protein thyretinin is the fibrils of the senile cardiac amyloidosis consist of. In the Portuguese type of polyneuropathy, which you never know, the boards could test you on this. Um, this is deposition of transthyretinin. Of transthyretinin, a serum protein made by the liver that normally functions in the transport of thyroxine and retinol. So that leads to amyloidosis, which leads to a severe peripheral neuropathy. So note that this is the same protein found in senile amyloidosis. So these have the same two proteins, Portuguese type of peripheral neuropathy. So that's amyloidosis in a nutshell. So let's talk about apoptosis. What is apoptosis? Apoptosis is the process of programmed cellular death. So it's enzyme mediated. Enzyme mediated. It occurs when the persistence of a cell would be disadvantageous to the body as part of a regression of embryonic structures destruction of lymphocytes in the thymus, and destruction of viral infected or cancerous cells. The body under, makes these cells undergo apoptosis. That's characterized by cellular shrinkage, chromosome, uh, or chromatin condensation, which is known as pycnosis, and membrane blebbing, DNA fragmentation, or karyohexis, um, and the formation of apoptotic bodies, which are phagocytized. Now, this is very important. There is no significant inflammation involved with apoptosis as opposed to necrosis where there's a ton of inflammation. Now, there's two types of apoptosis. You have physiologic and pathologic. Now, physiologic, let's, there's six causes here that we're going to talk about. And this, the first one is the death of the embryonic cells in the, limb, in the limb buds, which forms the fingers and toes. You have death of cells on the surface of the intestinal mucosa. You have death of endometrial cells at the end of the menstrual cycle. That makes sense. You have atrophy of the endometrial lining during men menopause. Number five, you have a death, death of self-reacting lymphocytes during maturation. And you also have the death of host cells during ac acute inflammation. So that is physiologic apoptosis. Now let's talk about pathologic. So what's the difference? Well, pathologic is more like when you have hepatitis viral-induced liver cell apoptosis, which leads to the formation of councilman bodies. Um, you also have immune, rela immune injury related of skin keratinocytes. That is known as savat bodies. I just put those in there in case they tried to fool you with some big words. Um, injury, injury is stimuli like radiation, hypoxia, etc., Corticosteroid-induced atrophy of the neonatal thymus, death of cells when accumulated, uh, misfolded proteins, etc. Now, the extrinsic pathway has fast interaction 
fast interaction with the FAS ligand, which activates the caspase cascade. Caspase cascade. Now the intrinsic pathway, this is cellular damage is sensed by P53, which signals the cell to cycle the arrest. Remember that P53 signals cellular arrest in the cell cycle. So what does, well, P53 activates, what happens is P53 activates a protein known as BAX. It's a pro-apoptotic gene which allows cytochrome C to be released from the mitochondria. Now, when cytochrome C in the cytosol, it activates something called APA, a path one. PATH1, which activates caspase 9, which activates caspase 3. So the BCL2, this is a proto-oncogene named for its role in the pathogenesis of B-cell lymphoma. BCL2 is encoded by the BCL2 gene which blocks apoptotic mechanisms in two ways. In two ways. Number one, it prevents leakers. Um, it prevents leakers of apoptotic effectors from the mitochondria. And number two, it binds what we were just talking about, APA, APA1, and inhibits the inactivation or the activation by cytochrome C. So that's the two ways BCL2 blocks apoptotic mechanisms. Now, if the cell is stressed or damaged, activation of the BAX, BAK, leads to formation of pores in the mitochondrial membrane. Now, the BAX, BAK also have the effect of blocking the function of BCL2. So, this combination leads to cytochrome C released into the cytoplasm, and therefore, you get what? Apoptosis. Now, it's also involved in follicular lymphoma, which is a translocation of the 1418. And that leads to excessive production of BCL2. Excessive production of BCL2. Now, let's talk about some cardinal signs of the good old inflammation, which is a fluid response to injury. It's a fluid response to injury. There are four common features of any inflammatory response. That's rubor, which is the redness due to the dilation of the blood vessels. That's dolor, which is pain due to increased pressure exerted by the accumulation of interstitial fluid. And to mediators such as bradykinin, prostaglandin, PGI2, PGE1, PGE2, etc. Now, the calor is the heat due to what? Where do you have increased heat from? Increased blood flow. Now, the two more is the swelling due to extravascular accumulation of fluid. And then you have also something called function lasium. Function lasia, which means loss of function. So, the fluid exudation. This is vascular permeability that is increasing. So it's facilitating extra vasation of immune cells and nutrients and carrying away toxic metabolites of the inflammatory response, resulting in net fluid exudation. It begins with a brief period of arterial vasoconstriction, vasoconstriction followed shortly by dilatation of the arterioles, the capillaries, and post-capillary venules. So first you constrict, then you dilate. The resulting increase in blood flow to the affected area clinically manifests as redness and warmth. As redness and warmth. Now fluid exudation may also be caused by endothelial injury or contraction of endothelial cells in the post-capillary venules with widening of the intraendothelial gaps. This increased capillary permeability results in leakage of proteinaceous fluid causing what? Edema. That's exactly right. 
causing edema. So let's talk about cellular injury. Cellular injury is, let's not make this more complicated than it is, it's very simple. Cellular injury, injury may be reversible or irreversible, okay, depending on the severity of the insult. Common features of both reversible and irreversible is, I want you to remember this if you remember nothing else, decreased ATP synthesis, cellular swelling. I wonder why the cell would swell if you have decreased ATP synthesis. Well, let's look at this cell. Say this is a cell right here. Doesn't every cell have a sodium potassium pump? Pumps the potassium back in, pumps the sodium out in a 3 to 2 ratio, therefore keeping the cell negatively charged. Well, what if that sodium were to become trapped in this cell because the ATPase is not working? Chloride is going to follow that sodium, where water is going to follow that, and that's why this cell starts to swell. That is why you get cellular swelling in both. Um, also, mitochondrial swelling. You get dilatation and degranulation of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, so you can't make proteins no more. You get fatty changes. You get glycogen depletion. Um, why, why would you get glycogen depletion? Because the cells are starving, right? They need energy. They need that, they need that ATP. Um, and you also get autophagocytosis. Now, that brings us to findings in irreversible but not reversible cellular injury. This is cell membrane rupture. That's a big one. Pycnosis is nuclear condensation. Um, karyolysis is loss of nuclear chromatin. Karyohexis is nuclear fragmentation. I want you to notice nuclear, nuclear, nuclear. You start messing with the nucleus, and it is irreversible. Irreversible once you start doing that. And also you get lysosomal rupture. Um, which can lead to acid hydrolases in the uh, cytosol leading to all kinds of problems. Now, there's also an increased mitochondrial permeability with the influx of calcium. Now, what does that do into the cytoplasm? It activates phospholipases, proteinases, and DNAases. So that's why you don't want calcium in that cell. And once that sodium builds up in that cell, long enough like we talked about up here eventually it's got to find a way to get out and what it does is it switches with calcium because there's a sodium calcium exchanger in here so once that calcium gets in cells you start activating all these phospholipases these proteinases and these dnaases and that leads us into fibrosis so what is fibrosis well fibrosis is the deposition of extracellular matrix formation at the sites of inflammation resulting in fibrosis of tissue. Now, what happens is fibroblasts immigrate and proliferate, and it occurs resulting in deposition in the extracellular matrix. Okay? So these are all fibroblasts that you see that are doing this. It's the fibroblast fault, man. That's what leads to fibrosis. How long does it take fibroblasts to show up at a site of inflammation? It takes seven days before they show up. So let's talk about free radical injury. Free radicals are short-lived molecules that oxidate cellular components leading to cellular damage, especially DNA mutations. Now any molecule with a single unpaired electron in the outer orbital can be a free radical. This is initiated by several mechanisms, most importantly that I want you to remember is oxygen toxicity and radiation exposure. Radiation and oxygen toxicity, um, as well as normal metabolism, redox reactions, nitric oxide, transition metals, drugs, chemicals, etc. But you get a proliferation and a hypertrophy of the smooth mus or the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of the hepatocyte is a classic ultrastructural marker of what? barbiturate intoxication. So that could be how you're having free radical um, free radical injury through a drug. Now, the, to induce cell injury through membrane lipid peroxidation, protein modification, and DNA breakage, you need free radical degeneration that occurs via intracellular enzymes like glutathione peroxidase, catalase, 
superoxide dismutase. You need endogenous proteins such as celluloplasmin, uh, spontaneous decay, and you also antioxidants like vitamin A, C, and E. Um, now, reperfusion after ischemic injury results in free radical production. This is very important in a heart attack. Like example, it leads to something called a superoxide. And they call that, and is a major cause of injury after a thrombolytic therapy. That's reperfusion injury after ischemic injury. So let's talk about inflammation. Now, note that acute inflammation is the initial response to any insult, right? Because you're shutting down the what? Sodium, potassium, ATPase. And it's designed to eradicate microbes and restore tissue integrity rapidly with massive extravation of immune cells. Now, you get a hyperemia, and that occurs as a result of a loss uh, or a local release of vasodilatory metabolites. You see neutrophils. Are they the most prominent inflammatory cells um, of acute inflammation during the first several hours? You see monocytes that turn to macrophages, replacing neutrophils after one to two or even three days. They are capable of engulfing larger particles. They live longer, and they divide and proliferate with inflamed tissue. Now, lymphocytes are the most predominant or prominent inflammatory cells in what type of infections? Viral. Viral, fungal, etc. Everything but bacterial, you'll see lymphocytes. Now, eosinophils are the predominant inflammatory cells in allergic reactions and parasitic infections. Now, acute inflammation may be um, may progress to chronic inflammation if the insult is not cleared. Chronic inflammation is characterized by a walling off of the disease. You can kind of see that in this picture right here. We're starting to wall off where these immune cells are starting to wall off and form a granuloma. Um, chronic inflammation. Now, yeah, with the formation of uh, granulomas and fibrosis of the tissue, that's chronic inflammation. It's characterized by cellular reactions predominantly with the following cells. Macrophages. Macrophages. Lymphocytes. And plasma cells. Now, expression of cytokines and growth factors by macrophages, lymphocytes, and plasma cells result in the proliferation of fibroblasts. fibroblast proliferation. And you also get new vessels creating a scarring and distortion of the tissue architecture. Now, the granulomatous inflammation, that's characterized by granulomas, which are nodular collections of specialized macrophages known as epithelioid cells. Epithelioid cells. These are usually surrounded by a rim of lymphocytes, as you can see in the picture there. Those are epithelial cells, and they're nothing more than macrophages, so don't get that. Don't get a big deal about that. The etiology of granulomatous inflammation includes mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, mycobacterium leprae, fungal infections, such as histoplasm, capsulata, uh, Treponema pallidum, sprinciplus, Bartonella hensley, like cat scratch disease, Crohn's disease, sarcoidosis. I mean, we could go on all day long about granulomas formation. Now, note, granulation tissue is not made of granulomas. These are separate entities. That is very important that you get that down. Now, you can have an abscess, which is a cavity filled with pus, where you see neutrophils, monocytes, macrophages, and liquefied cellular debris. You can have an ulcer, which is loss of surface, surface epithelium caused by acute inflammation of epithelial surfaces. You can have a fissure, which is abnormal communication between two organs or between an organ and a surface. And ultimately, you can have a scar, which is the final result of tissue destruction destruction 
from or which is from collagen deposition resulting in altered structure and function. Now, progressive contracture of the wound occurs and wound healing strength will top out at about 80% by three months. No surprise there. 80% by three months. So what's that take us into leukocyte activation? So how do leukocytes get activated? That's what we're going to talk about. So the first thing we're going to talk about is leukocyte extra extravasation. Now what is that? It's the process by which leukocytes exit the vascular space and enter the peripheral tissues. Now why would they do that? They want to participate in the immune response. So its steps are, let's get a new page for this, margination. Margination, because remember they're marginated along the epithelial or endothelial lining. And then you go to rolling. Rolling, and from there, you this is just kind of a big picture of this. You start tight binding to the where you want to go to where the infected cell. And from tight binding, you go to something called diapedesis. Diapedesis. And then you get a chemotactic migration. Okay, so that's kind of the big picture of how this leukocyte extravasion is working. So let's go back and now that we understand that, let's talk about margination. This is also known as pavementing. This is where leukocytes localize to the outer margins of the bloodstream endothelium placing them adjacent to the vascular endothelium, okay? So usually the first step in leukocyte extravasation or migration from circulation is margination, okay? So you need to understand that because I've seen many questions about this um, on the USC, USMLA, QBanks, and, and whatnot. So what about rolling? So now that we've talked about leukocyte extravasation and margination, what, what is rolling all about? This has got to do with something called selectins. Selectins, as specifically E and P, E and P selectin, and now that's on the surfaces of endothelial cells and sil silated ligands, and they call that um, sial silyl Lewis X, silyl Lewis X, okay. So if you ever see that, don't be thrown by that. That's on leukocytes, and it causes the leukocytes to slow. It they slows them down, allowing them to do what? Why would you want to slow a leukocyte down? It allows them to roll on the inner surface of the endothelium. Now, there's also something called, this is not as high yield as E and P selectin, but there's also something called L selectin. L selectin. Now, that can also mediate rolling by binding to something called adressin. Binds to adressin. Binds to something called adressin. Okay? And it also binds to something called glycam 1. Glycam 1 on endothelial cells. And that is basically all rolling is. Just think of it. Remember, it's got to do with selecting. So it's selecting where it wants to go. It's slowing down. And that's basically all rolling is about. So what about adhesion? Adhesion is where leukocytes adhere, hence adhesion, to the endothelial surface through interactions of adhesion molecules. Now, the adhesion molecules that you're going to be responsible for on the exam are known as ICAM. That's the one I always remember. Um, and VCAM. I seem to always forget that one. On that, those are on the surfaces of endothelial cells and integrins on leukocytes. An example of the integrin would be, I'm sure you've heard of this in, in med school, like uh, L, LFA1, LFA1 and MAC1. Okay? So those are the integrins. Now, interleukin-1 
and tumor necrosis factor or TNF is what activates ICAM and VCAM on the endothelium. Okay. Now C5A, part of the complement system, and leukotriene V4 activate leukocyte adhesion molecules. So let's write that in there. C5A, it's interleukin 1. Interleukin 1, and what did I say? Tumor necrosis factor. Both of these guys activate ICAM1 and VCAM on the endothelium, and C5A, C5A and leukotriene B4 activate leukocyte adhesion molecules. Okay, now endotoxins enhance the activation of leukocyte adhesion molecules. Now, what would that lead to? If you, an endotoxin, activate leukocyte adhesion molecules, you end up with a neutropenia. Make sense? I hope so. Now, catecholamines and corticosteroids inhibit the activation of leukocyte adhesion molecules. So that is termed neutrophilic leukocytosis. I know that's a big, long word, but let's write that in there. Neutro. Neutrophilic leukocytosis. You need to know that. So, what what, what uh, inhibited the activation of leukocyte adhesion molecules again? Two things: catecholamines and corticosteroids. All right, and that is adhesion. So, what about tight binding? Tight binding is done by tumor necrosis factor and IL-1. Those are released by what? Macrophages and endothelial cells induce the endothelial expression of ligands for the integrins, mainly VCAM1. The one I always forget, which is very important. Now the ligand um, for the VLA4 integrin, and they also um, ICAM1, remember that, VCAM1 and ICAM1 is what is responsible for tight binding. Now when you think VCAM1, think VLA4 integrin, okay, VLA4 integrin. Now the ICAM1, the ligands for those are You tell me, what are they? LFA1, and there's one more, MAC1, what we've already talked about. Now, what are those LFA1 and MAC1? Those are the integrins, okay? Now, the chemokines produced at the site of injury act on the rolling leukocytes, and they activate the leukocytes. So it's these chemokines that are doing this. This process converts VLA4 and FLA1 integrins on the leukocytes to a high affinity state leading to tight binding on the leukocytes to the endothelium. Okay, so that is tight binding in a nutshell for you. So diapedesis. Diap diapedesis is the transmigration or the immigration of leukocytes as they pass between, pass between the endothelial cells into adjacent interstitial tissue. Now, this process involves integrins and leukocytes and CD31. Now, another way of saying CD31 um, is PCAM. Okay, you have to have that for diapedesis. And you also have to have ICAM1 on endothelial cells. PCAM is what plays the major role in diapedesis, okay? So if you don't remember anything, remember that CD31 or PCAM is what is involved in diapedesis for the transmigration and the immigration for these leukocytes. So remember that, so remember that guy.
Now, chemotaxis and migration, this is where leukocytes are attracted to and move toward an injury or site of infection guided by a chemotactic signal. Now, what would be a chemotactic signal? Cytokines. It's literally just cytokines. Um, some, cyto some chemotactic factor factors. factors to mention would be C5A, which we already have. C5A and other complement components, um, interleukin-8, interleukin-8 and other cytokines, also um, leukotriene B4, leukotriene B4. This is produced through enzymatic degradation of arachidonic acid by 5-lipooxygenase. Also, calirinin. Calicurinin or calicrine and informal methion. I know you probably never heard of that, but you need to know it. Okay, and that is an amino acid unique to bacteria, informal methionine. Okay. So that is diapedesis and chemotaxis. So now let's talk about phagocytosis. What is phagocytosis? Phagocytosis is the ingestion of particulate material with neutrophils and monocytes. Okay, it's the ingestion of particulate material with neutrophils and monocytes. Now, what is a monocyte? It's nothing more than a macrophage in the blood, right? So being the most important of phagocytic cells is these neutrophils and these monocytes or macrophages. So that's all phagocytosis is, just engulfing um, a particular material. Now, what is opsonization? Opsonization facilitates phagocytosis by tagging specific molecules to be phagocytized. The most important opsonins are immunoglobin G or IgG, IgG, and as you might expect, C3B of the complement cascade component. C3B, if you remember nothing else, remember that guy is involved in opsonization. That is very, very important to remember. All right, and then we come finally to the oxygen-dependent myeloperoxidase system or the MPO system. Now, intracellular, listen to me carefully, intracellular killing is mediated by the oxygen-dependent myeloperoxidase system in neutrophils and monocytes, not macrophages, okay? So only in number one, neutrophils, and number two, monocytes. A lot of people forget this, not macrophages. Very important. Very, very important. Um, the most important intracellular microbial process is this MPO system. Now, you also have NADPH oxidase, which forms O2 radicals from oxygen, which releases energy called the respiratory burst. The respiratory burst. And it's important to understand this concept because what are we doing? We're killing things with free radicals. Free radicals are highly reactive. They penetrate these cell walls, these bacteria, and all this stuff. Um, now, superoxide dismutase is what converts the O2 radical to H2O2 or peroxide. Now, myeloperoxidase combines this H2O2 with chlorine. Um, to form HOCl, which is nothing more than bleach, all right? And HOCl, I'll write that in there for you. HOCl with the free radical is the ultimate bactericidal agent. All right, so that's how it happens. Now let's talk about that one more time. NADPH oxidase forms O2 radicals from oxygen, 
which then superoxide dismutase converts this free radical oxygen to peroxide. Then myeloperoxidase, hence the name peroxidase, combines peroxide with chlorine to form bleach, the ultimate bactericidal agent. So that's leukocyte activation, and that is everything you need to know about it for the boards. Um, basically, it's just the immune response. So moving right along, necrosis. What is necrosis? Necrosis occurs with severe tissue injury resulting in the death of large numbers of cells with, this is important, with inflammation. You see inflammation with necrosis versus what do you not see it with? Apoptosis or apoptosis. It's actually not pronounced apoptosis, it's apoptosis. So, um, characteristic of invasive infections, hypoxia, and trauma is when we will see necrosis. Now, enzymatic degradation of a cell resulting from exogenous injury can also cause it. Um, so let's talk about the first one, coagulative necrosis. This is the one I want you to remember because he is, why would I want you to remember coagulative necrosis? It's the most common form of necrosis. It's often caused by an interruption of blood supply, which if you interrupt the blood supply, that leads to tissue ischemia, which leads to an intracellular accumulation of what? Lactic acid. Okay. Now, lactic acid will denature structural proteins and intracellular enzymes, because enzymes are proteins, and that prevents the autolysis of the cell. All right. Now, it can also be caused by ionizing radiation and intracellular accumulation of heavy metals such as mercury or lead. Okay. Now, coagulation necrosis occurs most commonly in organs supplied by end arteries with limited collateral circulation. So what would be a few of these? Well, definitely the heart, which as you can see in this picture here, the heart, um, can you name another one? The kidney. And there's one more, the spleen. The spleen, it can all occur in this. Now, however, Coagulative necrosis may be observed in all organs except one. You will never see coagulative necrosis in this organ. Anybody know what it is? In the brain. You will not see coagulative necrosis in the brain. Okay? But let's move on to liquefactive necrosis. This is enzymatic liquefaction of necrotic tissue most often seen where in the central nervous system so you will see liquefactive necrosis in the brain why because the brain's pretty much 95 percent fat all right now it's caused by an interruption of blood supply so liquefactive necrosis also occurs in areas of one more thing besides the interruption of blood supply a bacterial infection okay so it's either interruption in blood supply or a bacterial infection. Now, caseous necrosis, it shares features of both coagulative and liquefactive necrosis. Now, when we want to see caseous necrosis from what you learn in medical school, it occurs in tuberculosis granulomas and fungal granulomas. So when you see caseous necrosis, think TB or fungus granulomas. All right, now pancreatic necrosis or enzymatic fat necrosis results from liberation of pancreatic enzymes with autodigestive properties and it autodigests the pancreatic parenchyma. Now, fatty acids, listen to me very carefully here, fatty acids combine with calcium, Ca2, to form chalky fat deposits. This is known as saponification. They like to test about this, so definitely remember that. Saponification. These chalky calcium deposits can sometimes be seen on x-ray in patients with chronic pancreatitis. Okay? So you're not as likely to see it with acute, but saponification will be seen with chronic pancreatitis.
Now, trauma fat necrosis, it can occur from trauma to fat cells and can affect any adipose uh, deposit tissue, such as the breast or the paniculus, okay? And that's basically all it is. Now, fibrinoid necrosis is characterized by deposition of fibrin-like proteinaceous materials in the walls of arteries, arterioles, or glomerular capillaries due to basement membrane damage. Basement membrane damage. It's usually secondary to immune-mediated diseases. A great example is Helon Shalom Purpura or HSP. Now, it sometimes can be secondary to non-immune-mediated diseases such as malignant hypertension. All right. And then I didn't put this in there, but you can also have gangrenous necrosis, and that results from a disruption of blood flow to the extremities or the bowel, as you might expect. So that's necrosis in a nutshell for you. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about is tissue repair. Tissue repair involves tissue-specific labile cells and immune cells such as fibroblasts and macrophages. Now, labile cells, they divide actively throughout life to replace lost cells, such as the epidermis or the gastrointestinal mucosa, so that um, cells lying in the surface of the genital urinary tract, or hemopoietic cells of the bone marrow. These are all labile cells. Now, what's a stable cell? A stable cell undergo a few divisions, but they're capable of division when activated. Now, a great example of a stable cell will be a hepatocyte. Uh, renal tubular cell, smooth muscle, cartilage, endothelium, and osteoblast. They're not rapidly dividing, but they're stable, and they can undergo division when activated. All right, the one I would remember is the hepatocytes. Um, and then you have permanent cells. These are incapable of division and regeneration and replaced by scar tissue after irreversible not reversible, but irreversible injury and cell loss. Now, there's only three cells you need to know that do that. That is, number one, your CNS or neurons, um, my, your heart or myocardium, and three, skeletal muscle. Thank you if a shark bites uh, part of your, your uh, hamstring off. Does it grow right back? No, it's, it's lost forever. So let's talk about edema. What is edema? This is excess fluid in the interstitial tissues or serous body cavities. Based on a physical exam, edema can be classified as either pitting edema or non-pitting edema. Now, an example of pitting edema is a noticeable dent or a pit that remains long after pressing down on the edematous area with your finger or thumb for a couple seconds. All right, and that brings us right into transidate versus exudate. Now, a transidate is, I want you to think pitting edema when you think transidate. Transidation is caused by a decreased, decreased oncotic pressure. Decreased oncotic pressure. Now, what is oncotic pressure? It's nothing more than the, in the proteins in the blood vessels, uh, like albumin is the greatest one we have, to, to hold air, water in the, in the vessel instead of leaking out into the interstitial. Okay, so um, what is an example of decreased oncotic pressure? Nephrotic syndrome, liver failure, etc. And um, also, transudation is caused by an increased hydrostatic pressure. Now, an increased hydrostatic pressure, give me an example of that. Congestive heart failure is the best example of that. Um, so, there you go. Now, in contrast to exudation, transudation does not involve an increase in small vessel permeability. So, that is important to remember. Does not involve an increase in small vessel 
permeability. Now, characteristics of transidate. Let's get a new page for this. Transidate. Transidate characteristics. Number one, you have a low protein content. Number two, you have a low specific gravity. Usually less than 1.012 is the number you're responsible for. And number three, hypocellularity. All right, think of transidates as proteins, and it makes life so much easier. And cell pore ultra infiltrates of blood. So let's go back, and now let's talk about the other one, an exudate. This is non pitting edema. Now, exudation is caused by an inflammation-induced increase in small vessel permeability and the resulting escape of intravascular fluid, proteins, and blood cells into the interstitial tissues or body cavities. Um, a great example is pus. Pus is an example of purulent exudate. Now, characteristics of exudates. We'll compare and contrast here. Um, you have a high protein content. You have a high specific gravity. It's usually greater than 1.020. And number three, it contains large numbers of inflammatory leukocytes. Inflammatory leukocytes. And other cellular debris. So that is a transidate versus an exudate for you. So basically, when you think exudate, all you need to think is inflammation. Inflammation that leads to an increase in the small vessel permeability. That's what allows the intravascular fluid, the proteins, the blood vessels, or the blood cells to leak into the interstitial tissue and body cavities. So that is the basic pathology for you. Um, best of luck to you. Oh yeah, baby.